Is urban agriculture any better than industrial agriculture? On January 22nd, this story broke about a University of Michigan study that said that urban agriculture has a carbon footprint that is much greater than that of industrial agriculture. Immediately, social media started freaking out. And of course, as often happens when you get into the details, the study isn't saying exactly what it seems to be saying. But it does have some important insights for sustainable city design. Now, in my view, the climate approach taken by the study ignores several deeper questions, but it still has many valuable lessons for us, so let's dig in and see what we can learn. Welcome to Edenicity, Best Practices for Sustainably Abundant Cities. Here's the original article, comparing the carbon footprints of urban and conventional agriculture by a large team led by Jason Hawes, a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. This appeared in Nature Cities on January 22nd. On the same day, the same authors released a short summary version of the study in the conversation with a best practices takeaway sheet. See links below for details. Also on the same day, The Telegraph ran this headline, carbon footprint of homegrown food five times greater than those grown conventionally. Young Americans for Liberty, a Facebook group with one million followers, took the story and ran with it under a comment that read, which country will be the first to declare home gardens of climate crime? This is absolute lunacy. On January 26th, the Atlas Society, a Facebook group with 240,000 followers, ran the Telegraph headline, along with this image of Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg apparently scolding home gardeners with how dare you underneath the comment, now will they come for your backyard vegetable garden? And of course the cherry on top was January 29th when Joe Rogan posted this to his 19 million Instagram followers. Anyone that discourages people from growing their own food is not your friend. Now before anybody jumps on the comments, isn't it interesting how quick we are to run paranoid fantasies before we have any details? I'm not blaming anyone. It's a universal human trait. Our minds are lightning fast at modeling survival scenarios. It's easy to see shapes in the bush and imagine something's really there. But that one time out of a thousand, when it really is a tiger, it's good that we not only see it, but can imagine with some accuracy just what it might do. Sometimes I wonder if in our modern society we are starved for this kind of stimulation. Of course, news organizations, political campaigns exploit this quality of our minds. Instead of jumping out of the way of a tiger, we click, we react, we comment, we buy, we donate. I even use it in the thumbnail for this episode. More often though, we bog down investigating the topic without taking action, or we just retreat into an angry fog of helplessness. But today, let's get into the details of this report because there really are some deep lessons. And just in case we get interrupted, be sure you're subscribed. The original study looked at 73 urban agriculture sites in New York City, Paris, London, Germany, and Poland. This included 55 individual gardens, this would be backyard food gardens, nine collective gardens or community gardens, and seven urban farms. Now that is a really small number of urban farms. And finally, they looked at two combination sites where they really couldn't tell whether it was any of the above, all of the above, none of the above, but they counted them anyway. The study compared these to 133 conventional farms, and I'll explain how they did that in a moment. The study focused on low-tech urban farms and not rooftop greenhouses. It somehow lumped these together with other high-tech high energy solutions such as vertical farms. By the way, the reference design for Edenicity uses rooftop greenhouses in a way that I think is fairly low energy. I put a link to it in the description. The study performed life cycle analysis, LCA for short, of carbon produced by same size baskets of the top five produce items for each country. Typically things like beans, carrots, lettuce, onions, and tomatoes, although from context I gather there was some variation. The life cycle includes the carbon produced by the energy it took to build the infrastructure divided by how many years that infrastructure lasts, as well as the carbon produced to supply and irrigate the farm or garden. In urban agriculture, infrastructure would be things like fences, raised beds, trellises, paths, sheds, tools, and equipment. Supplies would include seed, compost, fertilizers, shade cloth, plastic mulches, and gasoline for machinery. The study also looked at the carbon costs of irrigation, which requires pumping and hence electricity. Now for study methods, the researchers toured the gardens, took direct measurements, and left logbooks for the farmers and gardeners to log their inputs, activities, and harvests day by day. Now for the conventional farms, the infrastructure would include things like fences, combines, tractors. Supplies would include, of course, seed, fertilizer, pesticide, herbicide, gasoline for machinery. Irrigation, again, would include pumps and electricity. In addition, they looked at the handling, the packing, the transport, the display, 
and uh, energy used by the equipment used to sell the produce at market. But one really big difference for the conventional farms was that the study used outside data from large reviews of multiple life cycle analysis studies of farms in each of the countries. This is a problem because you don't have the same researchers studying both the urban and the conventional farms. The study also left a few things out, and we'll get into those in a moment. What were the results? Deep breath now. Overall, urban agriculture had six times higher carbon emissions than conventional farms, but 17 out of the 73 urban sites had lower carbon emissions than the conventional farms. 43% of the urban farms, in other words, three out of the seven, 25% of the individual gardens, and 0% of the collective or community gardens had lower carbon footprints. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, how is this possible? How can giant combines, petrochemical fertilizers, pesticide, international shipping and displays in supermarkets produce less carbon dioxide than home gardeners with hand tools? Well, the biggest difference between urban and conventional agriculture was infrastructure. Commercial agriculture does have huge combines and outbuildings, but the fields in which they work are much, much bigger, and there's not much else. Community gardens, meanwhile, have raised beds, paths, pavers, sheds, and tools. This community garden in Bexley, Ohio, has 40, 32 square foot raised garden beds, which adds up to a very small 1,280 square feet. That's a really small amount of growing space for a really huge amount of infrastructure. The study also mentions that collective gardens are often temporary, subject to development pressures. All right, I'm going to let you in on a dirty little secret about some of these community association gardens. In my current neighborhood, it's basically a tactic to keep land in the land bank out of the hands of developers so that new projects are not built in people's backyards. Now, the downside of this is that Columbus is now in a housing crunch. Rents are up 30 to 50 percent just this past year, so I don't know how long this is going to last. The other factor with community gardens is that they vary a lot from year to year in terms of public participation. For all of these reasons, community garden infrastructure tends to be fleeting. And for reducing carbon emissions due to garden structures, longevity is key. So the study looked at how long it would take for the infrastructure to last long enough for its carbon footprint to break even with conventional agriculture. For urban farms, the number was three years. For urban individual gardens, the number was 80 years. And for urban collective gardens, that is community gardens, basically the answer was never. Now, in addition to structures, there's supplies, which would, for community gardens, include mowing the grass paths, which would take gasoline, managing compost, which often is done poorly, and when this happens, it tends to emit methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. And finally, of course, irrigation, which can be very carbon-intensive in urban farms where they're pumping a lot of water. According to the study, there are four takeaways for urban agriculture. First, it should preserve infrastructure for as long as possible. The study suggested repairing rather than replacing sheds, raised beds, paths, and tools, and repurposing construction waste. Second, leverage urban waste streams. This would be compost, stormwater, gray water, which is to say dishwater, as well as construction waste to build the garden structures. Third, invest in social benefits. This was one I wasn't expecting. Basically, gardens are great for mental health. That wonderful garden smell, maybe the smell of rain approaching, this is called petrichor, and it actually has an antidepressive effect. Also, in a garden, a lot of people tend to build social networks. And finally, when they consume the produce, this improves their diet. All of this tends to reduce hospital emissions, and hospitals are very carbon intensive. That last point about diet is really powerful. I remember working in the community gardens on the west side of Bloomington, Indiana, about 14, 15 years ago. And there were children from some nearby housing projects who used to come visit us in the garden. The kids just basically mobbed us in the spring when we were picking the overwintered spinach. They were eating it like candy. Well, if you've ever had overwintered spinach, you'll know why. It has some nice sugars in it that give it a little bit of a antifreeze effect, and it's noticeably sweet. And at that point in the year, it's nutritionally wonderful. It's just lovely stuff. The kids couldn't get enough of it, and we're almost like fighting over it. So it's really hard to overstate the social value of making gardens available to people. For this reason, the study suggested allocating over 90% of the infrastructure in a garden to social benefits. And the fourth item was to focus on carbon intensive crops such as tomatoes, which are typically grown in hot houses, and asparagus, which is often very costly to ship via air freight. Now, the study noted a few things that it didn't model. 
These included season extension versus air freight in the winter, the way that urban agriculture may displace higher carbon foods such as meat, dairy, and grains, carbon sequestration in soils treated with compost, urban agriculture in hot climates. That's a big one in my opinion. The study only went for one year, not multiple years. Again, that's another really big one. It didn't look into conventional sorting infrastructure, although it did look at the sorting infrastructure of urban agriculture. What I mean by sorting infrastructure is basically the processing room where you field wash your produce and package up for distribution. And finally, it didn't model rooftop gardens, which were deemed high-tech and wasteful with their pumps and lights. Now, some things that the study overlooked but did not mention included other environmental effects not due to carbon. These would include topsoil loss, biodiversity loss, habitat destruction, poisoning from pesticides and herbicides, and even nitrate removal from freshwater, which can be very expensive and carbon intensive. I also noticed that these studies don't model how fresh local produce displaces milled foods. The more fresh produce you eat, the less processed foods you eat. Things like flour, cornstarch, high fructose corn syrup. This is important because milling has an enormous carbon footprint. In his book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, Michael Pollan points out that it takes 10 times as much energy to mill the grains as you get from them when you eat them. That means that more than 90% of the energy that produced these foods came not from the sun, but from fossil fuels. I would also add that we should build the infrastructure to last. First, by planning and designing the agriculture into a site from the beginning. Second, by using durable, living design elements. In the UK, for example, hedgerows have stood for up to 700 years in some locations. Third, you should stack functions. This is foundational to both permaculture and Edenicity, which is based on permaculture. Hedgerows are a perfect example of this. They function as fences, a food reserve with edible leaves, berries, and nuts. They provide bee and animal forage. They provide mulch. They are wonderful, multifunctional, super long-lasting living infrastructure. But the really big concept that the study left out is yield. How much produce per unit area does each method produce? This plugs into the much larger narrative that small local agriculture could never feed the world. If you're like me, you grew up watching Green Revolution propaganda videos in grade school that basically said that all the billions and billions of people in the world would starve if we didn't have giant factory farms. But as David R. Montgomery points out in his book, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, in 1989, the U.S. National Research Council commented that small alternative farms have lower costs, higher yields, and fewer inputs than conventional agriculture. In 1992, the U.S. Agricultural Census followed this up with the comment that small farms had yields per hectare that were two to ten times more than big industrial farms, and that the very smallest farms had yields that were up to a hundred times as much per hectare as the larger farms. In this 2021 Unsustainable Magazine article, David Fisher describes his experiments in a home vegetable garden. He found that he could grow enough to feed a person on 1,400 square feet which is about 1% of the three acres it would take to grow this commercially. This was using hand tools, seven hours a week, in part shade, clay soil, not an ideal environment. Going back to that Bexley Community Garden, by mid-season, half of the beds were basically abandoned, and from the abandoned beds, volunteers were able to grow some 2,000 pounds of produce, again on a fraction of those beds. And finally, garden diets displace the dairy, meat, and grains we get from large farms, providing us not only a healthier diet, but also one that can be supplied on a much smaller area. The purpose of Edenicity is to end the mass extinction by reversing the sprawl that destroys wild habitats. This includes our sprawling food system. In the Edenicity model, food is professionally grown where people live. That is to say, we use urban farming. Best practices include professionally managed compost, capturing stormwater, and in some cases, gray water for irrigation, using living elements where possible, and stacking functions like we did with those hedgerows. The common areas of Edenicity can have an ornamental function with many social benefits. Fragrant blossoms in the spring, beautiful foliage in the fall. They should also stack functions and provide some food. The trick, of course, is to make sure that you don't end up building waste into your designs. For example, with lots of fruit falling on walkways and rotting. So in summary, the Michigan study underscores what I've already said on this channel. Urban agriculture needs to be durable, protected, and professional. If we do those things, we won't have any problems producing less carbon than industrial agriculture. We'll also reduce our agricultural land use by factors of 10 to 100. 
Only when we do these things will we have the chance to restore the lost half of Earth's wild habitats and end the mass extinction. The best part is, this will be a healthier, more convenient, and tranquil way of life. And I can't wait to see you there. Take care, stay green, see you next time.